Okay, so we should be live. Um, I'm really excited today to have um, Dr. Ishtia Kamad with me. Um, I was really looking forward to this conversation, and I'm glad that uh, we're finally able to have it. So, um, Khushamadid people, as uh, Ishtia uh, Ahmed Saab likes to call on his channel. Uh, without further ado, I would I would add uh, Ishtia Saab to the call. Hello, Ji. How are you doing, Dr. Ahmed? Very well, thank you. I'm I'm How sorry for <laughs> I'm good. I'm sorry for the little mishap uh, no. that we had <laughs> in joining this call, but yeah. No problem. Yeah, yeah. How have you been keeping up though? Because um, I I really watch a lot of your content uh, on your YouTube channel, but I also uh, I'm a big fan of your book. I'm currently making my way through your Punjab book. So uh -huh. could you sort of talk a little bit about uh, this whole process of uh, taking to videos online and and also adding it. as another venture of uh, your creative process well actually some friends told me that uh, reading books and and uh, you know spending time in understanding the whole content of a book is becoming increasingly less attractive to many people they just want the gist of things so why don't you start doing videos on on uh, your research i was a bit hesitant because you have to over simplify in a video and uh, sometimes the complications which are there in the book in terms of research cannot be made explicit but then i decided that this is an this is one way that you connect with lots of people including for example you <laughs> so so the videos have come to stay with me but i continue doing my research as well okay yeah yeah can you can you talk a little bit about this uh, your background and how you got into the research that you are doing as like a political scientist but also primarily looking at what your research interests are like south asia uh, human rights and those sorts of things well uh how did i get into doing this research you want to know yeah i mean what was what i'm born was... i'm born on the 24th of february 1947 oh, in wow. lahore <laughs> on temple road where two horrific incidents took place and my mother was witness to one of them this was on the 12th of august 1947 when she was just looking out from our window which opens on temple road and she saw that on her right hand the local hooligans you know gunda type had assembled at that time lahore was on fire you know stabbings killings were taking place all over so she could sense that there was some problem on the way with this sort of uh, crowd you know assembled in the square and then she looked on her left and she saw a uh, a seek coming on a motorbike he was a big man you know and and these gundas tried to attack him he took out a gun and they dispersed you know in punjabi we say they titter bitter ho gaye you know <laughs> yeah most of such people are basically cowards bullies are normally cowards so they they dispersed then about 20 minutes later an old sikh carpenter came on his bike and on the handle of his bike was the daily potli potli is a piece of cloth in which you have the meal for the day and he was going to his work wherever you know common people didn't understand that the partition is taking place and you are no longer uh, wanted here and you must leave or whatever so these people killed this man in a merciless manner he kept on pleading for mercy but nobody uh, uh, paid any heed and that traumatized my mother and so i grew up listening to this story and then this was confirmed from people who had shops and and so on on temple road who continued to talk about this story so i grew up wondering why the partition who were these people who lived here once and we never see them again hindus and sikhs very close to our house is a, 
a Sikh temple called Chemi Badchai, Badchai, uh, apparently established by one of the gurus, but rebuilt in 1930s, where a planned attack was, uh, you know, undertaken with the connivance of the police by the local gundas on Sikhs who had come from northern Punjab waiting for a chance to cross the border into India. Okay? So that's another incident from just 200 meters from where our house is. Both these stories were always uh, being told and retold and discussed. So that's one reason. And I wondered what was the partition all about? Then when I was at uh, Stockholm University teaching and all, the Yugoslav uh, civil war came about. And once again, it was a repeat of ethnic killing, genocide, ethnic cleansing taking place. So I thought I had to uh, uh, dig into the past of this, uh, uh, you know, huge tragedy which transpired in the Punjab. And I found there was very little literature that you could refer to, scholarly literature. Of course, there was fictional literature in abundance. Manto, Krishan Chandar, Bedi, Khushwan Singh, you name the uh, writer, Punjabis and non-Punjabis, all of them wrote their best stories on the partition. But insofar as scholarly research is concerned, very scant material. Mostly it was the reports left behind by the governors and chief minister, uh, chief secretaries of Punjab. And historians are used to looking at archival material, so they would stop on the 14th of August. But the real killing started on the 15th and then continued till the end of the year. You know, about 10,000 people were killed by August 14, 1947. At the end of the day, anywhere between 800,000 to 1 million Punjabis had been killed and 10 million had run for their lives to cross the border, depending on whether they were Hindus, Sikhs, or they were Muslims. So that's where I thought that I had to do something to, to uh, uh, bring about uh, the oral histories or eyewitness accounts of the partition of Punjab. Of course, in India, some work had been done, very limited, but still very relevant. And that was in 1997 on the 50th anniversary of the partition. And Urvashi Batalia did a book. Then uh, Ritu Menon and uh, Kamla Basin did another book. These were Indian feminists who talked to some women from northern Punjab around Rawalpindi who were now living in Delhi and around Delhi and told their story. But I had the ambition of doing it for the whole of Punjab. So then I applied for a grant to the Swedish uh, Academy, which they very generously uh, gave me. Then I had three full years of visiting Indian Punjab and then Pakistani Punjab. And, and after that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, grant finished, I was still not done with the story. So I kept on working on it from my own sort of salary and so on. So altogether, about 12 years in doing that book. I collected about 400 uh, uh, eyewitness accounts, of which about 200 and 60 or so are in the book because some were only repetition of the same, you know. So that's the story of the Punjab book. Yeah, I've been I've been reading the Punjab book and it's very thorough in, in the analysis it's done. It's almost every paragraph is like flooded with references, which just shows your uh, scholarly brilliance. And that's something I'd like to get into in this conversation. But before that, um, you talked about these figures being there uh, who had written about 
these instances of the partition in Punjab and those sorts of things being Manto, uh, among other names. So this is this is sort of like a hypothetical question, maybe not one of the serious ones out there. Uh, but this is generally something I ask my guests. So it's basically a hypothetical question that if you had an opportunity to sit down and just listen to a conversation of three intellectuals or three individuals who you admire, this could be from the past or the present, who would they be? Three individuals having a yeah. conversation? Yeah, and you're, you're just like a fly on the wall. You can, you can listen into a conversation. Well, I wish I was there when Mahatma Gandhi and Jinnah met in 1944 for the prolonged discussions. Then I would have wanted to be uh, around when Nehru and Jinnah met again in 1947, I think, or 46, to negotiate whether the Muslim League could be brought into the government. I think these were the three players... Uh, uh, maybe one would have wanted to know <laughs> even what Patel was saying and what Maulana Azad were, was, was saying. But if I have to choose, then these three persons. Do you think these individuals that you just listed, Nehru, Jinnah, Gandhi, like in some ways they sort of define how we sort of look at the subcontinent in the modern world? Like how okay. in some sense there is uh, there is a Nehruvian India which is in some sense, getting lost with the yeah. with the current party that's in power right now, um, compared to like an Islamic state uh, that Pakistan is right now, which is also in contention as to should it have been an Islamic state, should it have been an, a secular state? So, d is that in, in some sense, do you almost see uh, the lives of three individuals as, in some sense, how we look at the subcontinent in the modern world? I would say that were it not for Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the bloodshed which ultimately took place would have been many times more. Yeah. So he brought the soothing, healing effect, you know. And uh, without Jawaharlal Nehru, there wouldn't be a modern, secular, inclusive, progressive India. Regarding Jinnah, I think he was a tragic figure. He just wanted the partition of India I think if I were to really try to understand his psychological fixation, to prove that he was no second fiddle to Gandhi or whatsoever. But the Pakistan he has bequeathed is full of all those contradictions. And although people latch on to one of his speeches of 11th August, where he was very secular, mm -hmm. unbelievably secular, uh, but that's the only speech of its kind. The rest is studded with references to Islam, with to a Muslim state, which would be an ideal democracy. So it's a hodgepodge of many ideas which Jinnah left behind. In the interpretation, then, which were the forces that came to dominate Pakistan? Those who believed in an Islamic Muslim type of state. So I think Jinnah is then uh, the the, the Pakistan he uh, created had all those potentials which have now, uh, you know, left their, uh, their, their imprint in, a, in an indelible manner. It's very difficult to dislodge it. One can even then wonder if Nehru's secular state has not faced a similar challenge. And I would say in India, the battle for a secular, inclusive democracy continues. In Pakistan, it was lost already on the first day. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, many people who sort of look at um, the subcontinent and look at, let's say, partition studies also have this sort of question that generally comes up. Is that, was the partition inevitable? Like, was it something that, um, as you know, there, there are thinkers who, who were back in the day talking about these things like Ambedkar, even Jinnah, that it, it is inevitable because there are two conflicting ideologies that are living together. So in some sense, you need um, each of them to have their own space where they can uh, where they can live peacefully. Would you would you completely buy that argument, or would you say that it would have been possible for one united India in some sense? I think if there was one united India, there was one thousand years of experience of living together 
of accommodating of uh, uh, you know intervening uh, to diffuse the situation all this was part of the 1000 years of experience of this region partition was a new thing it had no precedent historically and if you look at india pakistan relations has that promise been realized that you divide these people and there will be peace it's the other way around <laughs> both are nuclear power states who if they resort to this arsenal can you know uh, impose such destruction that for the next several thousand years we will have no civilization in this region so partition has not solved if at all there was a hindu muslim problem first of all of the 90 million 95 million muslims 35 million were left in india and if jinnah wanted to save islam and muslims this is what he kept on saying then they all should have been in pakistan because they were in the hindu majority provinces where they were the weakest and most of them were poor people as well so in a moral sense also i think the partition really partitioned the muslim community of the subcontinent yeah. the hindus were driven out the sikhs were driven out and they consolidated later on in east punjab and in the rest of india but the muslims are now divided between india and pakistan and since 71 even in bangladesh yeah. so i don't i'm not convinced that first of all i don't think partition partition was inevitable it was one of the possibilities definitely if two people can't live together you uh, give them separate states and maybe that's one solution you know after the first world war uh, turkey and greece exchanged their populations you know after the war but remember there was a bloody war which resulted in hundreds and thousands of uh, lives being lost so one can't say this was like a peaceful transfer it was peaceful only in the sense that it was preceded by a bloody bloody war okay so no partition really is normally a, a successful yeah yeah maybe a few cases when both sides agree and both sides have their own different spaces to live in but with the with the example of turkey and greece don't you think that even if it is a state that um, where let's say both uh, both let's say sets of people of different traditions different cultures different religions live together in some sense there is still one of those cultures which tries to dominate over the other however much we may like it or not so with the example that you gave of greece and turkey as well that's what's happening in the modern day with 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 the conflict of cyprus in some sense because in cyprus as well there's a big greek population and there's a, and there's also a turkish invasion of how they feel that uh, it's their land so yeah. in some sense do you feel that that will that, that is inevitable and you need in some in some sense leaders who have a vision that no it's it's not only the majority uh, majority community that gets to say uh, how the nation state will run yes i think india was a great example of a vision of india in which everybody had a place but the partition undermined it and its consequences then are uh visible uh, to us in the last 75 years and actually uh the worst arguments in the partition that hindus and muslims are two different nations uh they have nothing in common if taken seriously then this is what is what has happened makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. india and pakistan are loggerheads all the time and in india now there is a problem with the muslim minority although the bjp keeps on uh, uh, denying that uh, there is a, a, a that the muslims are beleaguered they say yeah. so is not the case but we know that 
elections even are won on a anti muslim sort of uh, 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 propaganda and don't so, you think that is that is the most sorry to cut you off but don't you think that is in some sense the most um, worrying thing for people who are living in modern india that it's almost that um, and many people have talked about this in the public landscape that whatever many of these hindus and i think in the punjab book you've sort of titled this as well that there was always this sort of feeling but people were hesitant to voice it out let's say against the other community and they that might have been not just with the hindus to the muslims but vice versa as well but it wasn't as such that there was one party was coming and saying that oh no uh, now you can actually voice it in the public sphere or something of that sort whereas in some sense i whenever i open one of these hindi newspapers it's it's full of dog whistles and something of that sort and that would have never occurred in the past i would or at least not to the extent that it's happening at the moment where people aren't even hesitant to let's say talking about the other community in a very uh, in, in in a very abject manner so don't you think that's what's that's what's most like problematic for for a democratic country it is absolutely it's majoritarianism which has become respectable and allegedly the muslims only harmed india but i keep asking my indian friends if that is true how come that in 7 800 years of dominating northern india uh, only 20% of the population actually converted to islam 80% remained yeah. hindus and my understanding is that those who came from central asia and established their dynasties and so on were like any other ruler who came and once his power or his dynasty consolidated they let the rhythm of the society continue as it is with some exceptions you know of course yeah. people who attacked hindu temples and looted hindu property that's also true but that could not have been a daily occurrence under muslim rule not at all it was have been an exceptional periods when this happened and also um, more and more we are sort of seeing um, in the public landscape and i think you've talked about this as well this aspect of revisionist history that's come about so it's almost that <laughs> every place that was possibly renamed uh, during the muslim rule has to go back to the original name that it was and Quite. is it and is it also official is it also original if in some sense that was also given a name at some point so in uh, like it's i understand uh, where the sentiment comes from but it, when it becomes when it becomes when it becomes harmful towards the other uh, let's say community and how the people in their uh, in their vicinity start looking towards the other community i think that is what's problematic Which but just well, you you do a lot of history writing yourself and you are a political scientist can you can you speak a little bit about this aspect of history writing like how do you particularly see it do you think that it is inevitable that when a party that comes to power will will want to faction their version of history so there was this thinker back in the day named uh, thomas carlyle and he came about with this concept called the great man theory of history i'm not sure if you know about it so he talked about this aspect that um history as we see it isn't about like what was actually in some sense what was actually there because there were so many things that happened but we only tell history through the great figures through the great men through the great wars that happened so it's not it's it it's it, it in some sense i do agree with it because it then says that to me who, why do i care about let's say a peruvian farmer i want to know about napoleon i i want to know about akbar i want to know about these men who did something more for the society so like how do first of all do you know this uh, aspect of the great man theory of history and if so like what do you think about it actually in my jinnah book this is one of the theories i have uh, yeah. taken up and discussed and that i say is very attractive to people who admire jinnah they think that jinnah got pakistan by virtue of his intelligence his skills his instincts intuition as a lawyer what argument to use when and i say that all ha- must be granted that he was a born leader cannot be questioned but what about the context had the british not wanted uh, a partitioned india and had 
Congress not taken up stands which antagonize the British, maybe things would have been very different. So if you bring things, Jinnah, into the context of what was happening at that time, then Jinnah is very lucky that he got away with his uh, brief, you know, about why he wanted Pakistan. But then he got a Pakistan very different from what he had demanded. He wanted the whole of Bengal and Punjab to be given to Pakistan, which, uh, which were partitioned. So he didn't get the Pakistan he claimed for the Muslims. Although that Pakistan too would have left one third of Muslims in India. And so for me, that is, that is a flawed idea of the Muslim nation. Either the whole nation is assembled in one place or there is no case for the Muslim nation having its own state. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, <clears throat> what really was the question? Didn't I answer I mean, it? I mean, in some sense you did, but don't you feel that... Um... I don't agree with this particular point, but many in the Hindu right also talk about this aspect that um, the idea on which India was built on wasn't taken into consideration of all aspects of society. And in okay. some sense, that is also that is also criticism that is given to uh, the Nehruvian India and when Nehru came into power that Nehru and Ambedkar, um, let's say, took the responsibility of the Hindu community on their own and put forward a Hindu code bill without consulting, let's say, uh, the people who they perhaps, uh, like the Hindu the Hindu community. And whereas that is almost inconceivable to have happened with, let's say, the Muslim community, the Parsi community or anything of that sort. So what my, what my general argument here is that Many in the Hindu right also say that the manner in which we look at India today is through this Nehruvian Marxist leftist way of looking at India. Okay. And there hasn't been, in some sense, a comprehensive way of looking at history that is encompassing of all uh, ideas of India. Because they say that, Acha, idea of India is all right, but whose idea of India? I think that is a valid argument. But if I were to look at the BJP and RSS idea of India and the <laughs> Nehruvian India, I would still prefer the Nehruvian yeah. idea yeah. of it. So my yeah. argument is, of course, uh, Jinnah's Pakistan had also different positions. There are people who are very angry with me that I don't accept that Jinnah was a secular, he wanted a secular Pakistan. I say he used it as an argument primarily to convince the Indian government not to drive 35 million Muslims out of India. Because had India done that, Pakistan would collapse within days. Hmm. So it was a very clever statement. He never returned to it again until his death. He reverts immediately to the Islamic aspect of Pakistan. Okay? So uh, that's the way I... I uh, so which legacy of Jinnah has prevailed? That about Pakistan being some sort of an Islamic uh, ideal state. Now, from one point of view, an ideal Islamic state is one where Muslims are citizens with certain rights and the minorities are only a protected community. Mm -hmm. So if one were to grant that sort of ideal Islamic state, uh, for me, that is a medieval notion of, of citizenship and so on. So Pakistan is somewhere in between, between a modern Muslim state and an Islamic state. It's not an Islamic state comparable to Iran, for example, or Afghanistan under the Taliban. It still has elections, it has a parliament, and there is a free press, more or less, you know, <laughs> which keeps on raising... Uh, uh, its voice against uh, the government in power. Imran Khan is daily attacked. Yeah. And, and, and so that has to be granted. Uh, so idea of India, yes, there, are, there can be many ideas of India. But the one I prefer is the one which I benefit, benefit from by living in Sweden. Mm. It's a secular state. Nobody knocks at my door and says, either you become a Christian or you pack up or leave. Yeah. You know, I became a professor here without having any ethnic religious connections here. 
only on the basis of merit you know and 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 so on so i prefer where everybody has a fair chance of realizing their best qualities india did even something exceptional they introduced uh reservations mm. for a historically disadvantaged group that i think was very noble so the indian constitution must be admired for its humane nature for its inclusive politics and for taking sides on in behalf of the most oppressed parts of society yeah that's what i prefer so of But, course if the if the hindu right defines india i'm sure they have an idea of india yeah 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 we are getting to see it a lot more nowadays especially yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. no but um dr ahmed like do, what do you think in some sense do you feel that it comes down to uh, an aspect of education that has to be pushed forward in schools um, and 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 in wider society as well that people can then actually critically think for themselves as to what wh- which side they want to fall on do they want to fall on a reactionary side uh, which wants to take you back to the vedic <laughs> uh, uh, lifestyle or do you want to actually be someone who is progressive and who wants technology and those sorts of things to have come about do you think in some sense is that is that through let's say the study of politics and the study of different disciplines that can be initiated in schools that people can then actually start these conversations to happen because many a times people wouldn't have these conversations and would um, like this whole bhakti culture in india that if there is someone as you said the great man theory of history right if there is a great man it's almost his his opinion becomes the opinion of the masses quite uh, well let me say like this that uh, uh repeat this question again yaar yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry my questions also very like tangential and long ended but my yeah. particular question is that do you feel do you feel that this aspect of critical thinking and this aspect of like yes, um, just logic Let's stop here yeah. now I, I, <laughs> I, i get i get your question yeah i think if i were to criticize nehruvin ne- india and all is that they went immediately for the best institutions for higher education hmm. mass education you know bringing all children into school that was left to the provinces and and was never a priority and so a secular culture and inclusive culture wasn't promoted at at a at the ground level you know there is a a, a documentary made by a gentleman called stalin from south india where he has shown how dalit children in village schools are systematically discriminated they can't use the the main uh, you know tap for drinking water and they can't sit with the other children and they still all go to school so the old caste system lives side by side with getting liter- literate you know so if you look at that aspect of niruvin india was a failure or was a a was neglected yeah. and some people say that because he was a brahmin he didn't care much for <laughs> for education <laughs> he went for the intellectual class that he belonged to didn't care so much for the people at the bottom uh, i don't know, i don't i don't know if that is a fair uh, uh, criticism of 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 <laughs> of him but i've heard that But uh, that was also yeah. that was also one of the critiques that Jinnah had against the Congress, right? He's like, you say that you represent all Indians, but you're only a Brahmin Banya community. You're just a Brahmin Banya uh, party that thinks that they're secular, but in some sense, it's not because just look at the num the, the people who are representing you. But that was the truth of Hindu society. I mean, yeah. since when were Dalits ever welcome in a Hindu social gathering? Never. No. But. still i must say that uh when the british were leaving in 1946 and ambedkar went to talk to them i'm talking about the cabinet mission plan i think the 6th of april 1946 the cabinet mission told ambedkar that we are leaving and your best bet is to jo- uh, to 
seek help of the Congress left. So within the left of the Congress, people understood that caste was a terrible thing mm. for the oppressed people uh, of India. But how many Dalits had been educated to become leaders except Ambedkar? You know, to get to the top of the leadership, you needed to have a modern education. And the privileged classes, the well-off classes, people came from such backgrounds. The same is true of the Muslim League. Jinnah and, and his supporters were, Jinnah was a self-made man, but the rest were landlords mostly. So what is true of the Congress in terms of its leadership background, in a way is different because many people in the Indian National Congress came from the middle class mm -hmm. and not the old landowning classes. Landowners were very few in the Congress. There was a large segment of the middle class in the Congress, but they were also upper caste. This is a true. This is true. But yeah. did the Congress deliberately keep the? Uh, let me give you an example to sort of question this thesis. Uh, in the first, in 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 early January 1940, three leaders met at uh, Mamdali Jinnah's house in in uh, Bombay. Jena Sahib was the host. Then Periyar, the, yeah, the leader South from Indian. the South, yeah. and, and uh, Dr. Ambedkar. And for three, four days, they were, uh, you know, talking to one another if they could form a party in which Muslims, South Indian, Dravidians, and the Dalits could be one party. Uh and there is a picture also I've seen later on. I mean, it's not in my Jinnah book, but there is a picture showing the three sitting there and talking to each other, okay? So this is uh, uh, verifiable. Anyhow, no party was formed as an alternative to the Indian National Congress. Then on the 16th of January, 1940, 1940 about two... Ten days later, Gandhi wrote a letter to Jinnah saying, My dear Kaide Azam, I address you as the Kaide Azam because everybody now calls you Kaide Azam. You are the only leader who can form an alternative democratic party. The Muslims, Dalits, and the Dravidians feel that the Congress is an upper caste Hindu party. Why don't you join hands and form an alternative party and challenge the Congress, but within a united India? Yeah. But uh, Jinnah didn't want to have a party in which his leadership had to be shared with Ambedkar and with Periyar. And from what we know, the reaction of both these leaders of, was of great disappointment with mm. uh, uh, Jinnah. I've given that in my a book on, on Jena. Yeah. So I think that such a, a an objection to the Congress existed is true, that it's an upper caste Hindu dominated party. But here was a possibility of forming an a, a, a counter counterweight to the Congress. And the three groups, if together if they had come together, that would be population wise almost the same. Yeah. Dalits, Muslims, and Dravidian South Indians. So, but Jinnah Sahib uh, uh, did not show any interest in it. And so it never happened. And in some sense, I think uh, I've mentioned, I, I've, I've heard in one of your talks that you'd mentioned that uh, that were the four identities that Jinnah had identified that what India comprises of. So he said that there are the Hindus, there are the Muslims, there are the Dalits, and then there are the Dravidians. So no, that... Yeah, that, at one point... Yeah, I think he mentioned he it. In, yeah, later on. I mean, it depends on when he was doing this counting. Yeah. <laughs> so that earlier, in 1937, yeah. he said there are four powers. Very interesting. The British, the Indian National Congress, the Muslim League, and the Princes. Hmm. The five, uh, 565 princely states. So 
uh, that's what that was in 1937 but earlier on you are right he said there are many nationalities in india and no indian nation and when he counted those nationalities it was hindus muslims sikhs dravidians and dalits okay, okay. yeah that's the that's the 30s early 30s wow um i have to ask you this question obviously i want to talk a little bit more about partition later on but as you are a political scientist uh, i've heard you in a couple of your talks also mention that you have sympathies for the left and those sorts of things um and i don't think many people have sort of uh, pointed that at you in many of the talks you've given so i sort of want to ask you about like in terms of political philosophy like is there one that you sort of most uh, inclined towards or or do you think that there is one that is true and that most society should model themselves on or do you think that it should always be an open board that people should people of different ideologies and different uh, ways of looking at the world should have their uh, have their examples in their states well i would say that from a marxist uh, sort of commitment i have moved m- more towards left social democracy i think the basic equality of all human beings must be recognized and respected but people are also very different from one another in their competence in their uh, uh, creativity so society must have space for all this variation as well mm. so freedom is also equally important a balance between the two is the best and as long as your ideology does not preach hatred of a of a group of people and and justify violence against them i think there should be enough room for discussion intellectual interaction yeah so i i would say that what marxism helped me understand was that there were the thing ha- comes from from heaven you know all what we have here is a result of man's doings you know good and bad yeah. and only we can rectify them or we can make the situation worse so i do not count in miraculous interventions of any sort i find i try to look for material causes of material situations like you... i say for example jena yeah. would not have succeeded had the second world war not taken uh, broken out and congress had not committed some major blunders on which jena uh, uh, successfully uh, cashed and finally the british had to be convinced that partition was in their best interest and and that's what happened so yeah. all this is explainable can be explained in terms of the material situation of that time and when i say material i don't mean economic reductionism which is what dogmatic marxism is always uh, you know uh, doing in its writings you know maybe over several hundred years the economic factor is important but day to day politics has a lot to do with just the situation as it obtains you know and and for the british uh, dividing india was important because they thought that the soviet union would uh, expand its influence in 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 south asia and india with its caste system would be uh, would be easy for communism to find its converts so we should create an islamic type of state as a as a frontline state and and i mean the the evidence you know the speeches and the arguments are all there in the jena book mm. so it's nothing that i'm relying on speculation i have given their actual documents where they say all this okay do you, so that is really interesting to hear and, and in some sense um i do agree with that that people of different in- inclinations of how they view the world sort of translates into how they view politics as well 
Uh, so if there is someone who is generally more compassionate and those sorts of things you would say that that sort of translates towards uh, a left leaning approach of how they look at politics and if someone is more about individual freedoms and individuality that does translate about to this this aspect of a more right wing way of looking at the world but don't you think that um this like when when it becomes like the example i'd like to throw about is the example of america where it is it, it's been 50 50 you could say so for so many years and uh, and i think that and most people would think that uh, that is great for a democracy to have but do you think that what's happening now if you are keeping track of uh, the situation in america that things are becoming very much polarized of that it is again becoming that um, where where the as- where the aspect of religion or god is removed people sort of have something that they want to insert there ki acha there is something that uh, will unite us or will give them meaning and politics is often what takes the shape there so do you think that even in a secular democratic state where let's say the state has no involvement in the religious landscape politics or political ideas will will almost take that space and and, and will sort of make people polarized uh yes i think looking at the facts of the last 40 45 years that seems to be true i think too much intellectualized rationalized uh analysis uh is is a temptation we academics and intellectuals uh, would make but the reality is exactly what you are saying people are swayed by the strangest of of prejudices mm. and conspiracy theories you know and so that factor uh seems to have gained salience all over the world you know there is a general lowering of standards of politics all over the world you know boris johnson is you know in power uh, he, <laughs> he he was found having a great time when uh, this covid thing happened but he didn't resign and he lied about it and, and he uh, lied about yeah. it the prime minister and you have i mean the- my so so there's a very interesting thing to say about this so i i am in the uk so my yeah. friends over here were telling me about this look he's a disgrace he's going to parties he's doing this he's doing that and i'm like i come from india you don't even know so if something like this would happen that's all right <laughs> we're, we're more more concerned about them there because i remember one of the ambani uh, weddings yeah it was such obscene display of wealth yeah unbelievable in such a poor country but people came you know in real style uh, from all over the world and nobody gave a damn yeah so this happens unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately the whole idea about we being human beings sharing our woes and our happiness and all that is a very attractive thing to latch on but the reality is uh, uh very different also this also this aspect of showboating which i see a lot of in politics and that's what sort of really doesn't leave a good uh, taste in my mouth where people like let's say narendra modi comes out and says i am a chai wala but then he goes and buys a 8000 crore plane for himself something of that sort to almost so it's and it's not only him there's so many politicians who are like that and this is something i've been thinking a, a lot about uh, and and as and as as a politis, political scientist i wanted to ask you there are many people say that it doesn't matter how honest or truthful a person is when they get into the system everyone just almost bends to the system and becomes corrupt and becomes uh, whatever thing is i in some sense hold a different opinion i think that if one is really true to their um, moral yeah. standing then it doesn't matter what sort of sy- what sort of system it is that they are taking uh, part in do you sort of fall in either boat that it's the system that sort of change changes individuals to what they become or do you think that there will all there is there are individuals who can uh, go beyond the system and and still hold a moral framework i think they can go beyond the system no doubt otherwise we'll all become cynics and there would be no need for you and i discussing we should just give up in despondence you know in despair no i don't think so i think in all such situations somehow some people take up 
the question of honesty, integrity, and 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 uh, things somehow are kept under control. You know, otherwise it would be uh, the law of the it, the law of the yeah. jungle. Yeah. yeah, yeah, law of the jungle sort of thing. Sweden is a good example. You know, our new prime minister, who's uh, a lady, uh, at her place there was someone doing the cleaning job, and uh, the media people found out that that woman didn't have even a work permit. So immediately this was taken up in the press, and the prime minister explained that she had nothing to do with this. It's only done through the regular sort of uh, uh, bureaucracy who sent her there. But, uh, I mean, people are really interested in knowing if the politicians who have been elected into office, uh, you know, adhere to the norms Mm. for which they are voted into power. So, or maybe small countries like Sweden can behave differently than, let's say, something like the United States of America, where you have all the lobbying uh, lobbies, you know, you have the uh, rifle club, which overrules all attempts to ban, you know, uh, firearms. Yeah. You have uh, the military industrial complex producing mm-hmm. weapons sold all so american democracy got compromised at the begin uh, uh sometimes after the second world war and uh, since then uh, elections are held and and uh, there is a difference however who's the president to a point you know i think obama did try to make some changes like the healthcare and all, but the society in general, you know, uh, he couldn't carry the people with him. You mm. know, American way of thinking is very different. Nothing from the state. You know, they think anything done by the state is socialism, communism. You know, that's the level mm. of American thinking. Whereas mm. the NHS in in the UK, in the UK and, yeah. Uh, it's taken for granted. Hmm. So it depends what sort of political culture and traditions have existed in in a particular uh, country. So this is really interesting that you touch about this aspect of political cultures and these traditions. And I generally agree with this, that the social fabric of a society, each society differs. And uh, and this was really fascinating for me when you were talking about this in your, uh, uh, in your Punjab book. I think in the preface you were talking uh, that in political science and in many social science disciplines, there is always this um, sort of conundrum as to are people really individuals or are they like just uh, parts of a group as to yes, like I... they can be they can be um, moved away through whatever the group is thinking and a group consciousness exists, but not an individual consciousness. Um, right. Would you would you sort of that in some sense, do you think that is the that is the core defining aspect of the right versus left? thing or how, however loosely we may sort of uh, define it of individualism versus collectivism um and if well, so it, like yeah i would say collectivism can also be evil you know when it becomes oh, yeah. a mob oh, yeah. when For it sure. becomes a mob uh and individualism can be very noble because in the punjab partition i show that whereas the mobs attacked you know hindus muslims and sikhs and killed them mercilessly you do have examples of individual Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs going out of the way and helping people from the so-called enemy community mm. at a great risk through their own lives. So I think somewhere in the overall context, the individual does matter. But the collective is the background in which things can happen. I'll mm-hmm. give you one example. There is this, uh, I met a gentleman while doing my research on the partition, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Farooq. He was from, from uh, Kapoor Thala state. 
and he said that uh, at the time of partition i was only a kid of about 4 5 years my father had died and uh, uh, we were now surrounded by the sikh jattas you they would come and kill all the men take away the young women and maybe get rid of children and so on but one sikh who was a friend of his father i think santa singh he knocked at the door and said uh, bbg to his mother uh, you get ready and i'll escort you to the uh, uh, refugee camp so he put this fellow this little boy on his shoulders his mother and three sisters they were walking towards the refugee camp when a sikh jatha surrounded them and they wanted to uh, uh, take the young you know uh, 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 women away and maybe kill the mother and this boy as well when santa singh challenged them and said ki tade guru ne sanu sirf eh hi sikhaya have the gurus taught you just this thing what what you are going to do and the leader the elderly man he got off the horse came and stood next to this fellow the sikh and said as sikh nu apni zuban da maan kaim rakhan dio if he gave his uh, a pledge to help this family let them do it and he says i was saved because of this so here is a mob normally the mob kills takes mm-hmm. away all the women all the property uh, uh kills the men around but it didn't happen so i would say that um, people act in a context but when they do there are situations when their individual bravery commitment cowardice it all plays a role yeah so there's generally this hypothetical that is uh, played about that um, for example and it's really it is really frightening to think about almost that for example if you were um one of the soldiers in the nazi party in in nazi germany or if you were one of the uh, people of the uh, in in the soviet union you were a soldier there and if you were ordered to sort of go ahead with with some killings or something of that sort would you have been one of those individuals who would have stood out from the crowd and said that no i'm not going to do it because for the most aspect of things people are going to go ahead with it because they're going to be safe right and i think there was uh, there was someone a political scientist who said that most people want to be safe and not free and 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 so it it almost becomes that you need uh, someone like an oscar schindler or someone like that who 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 is so let's say wild that he will go beyond his his safety to let's say take uh, care of the people around him so that so that yeah just through just through normal human rights that people don't get don't get consumed by uh, the ideologies and they think that the ideologies matter more than uh, the individuals around them and that is why we have history and history will never have an end because no social science no prediction about the future can be absolutely watertight there will always be exceptions and always be surprises you know hmm. some people will stand out from the crowd and do things like this and that is why it's fascinating to study the human yeah uh, society <laughs> you know but what do you think because uh, i think in your first your first chapter in the punjab book was about ethnic cleansing and yeah. so my general question here is and you've tried to explore it in depth and you've mentioned several sort of uh, people there as well like if i just have to talk about the 20th century like people like hitler stalin mao pol pot all these individuals who went ahead with these heinous crimes um what do you think it is that almost consumes an individual so much that he he thinks that if if i if only i sort of faction this ideology on a society wide level it doesn't matter if there are a few people who are killed here and there i think that's what that's exactly the words that mao used those were the exact words that stalin used that yeah we understand but for the betterment of socialism and for socialism to enter the world if there are a few people who die right now the people who are, who come down in the generations will remember the the society we built so, yeah i know that's a conviction of hardcore ideology fixated people yeah, yeah. that's true 
but you know even so called democracies have a uh, uh, horrible conduct to to uh, and they should be held accountable now look at this the british parliament we admire you know uh, the 1215 uh, what was it called magna carta yeah, and magna then carta, yeah. okay but the same parliament justified slavery you know slaves in the hundreds and thousands maybe millions were taken from africa and and transported to the united states what about the white man coming to the americas and and killing of the local populations so there is something wrong in terms of my group having the right to dominate i think the urge to domination is a is in built to in, in in human nature if you want to call it i am a bit hesitant to make a such a strong statement machiavelli thought this was just our nature that we want to dominate hmm. because we want glory we want power maybe that's true but then there are alternatives where you can keep these things in balance hmm. so the rule of law can uh, 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 can make a difference if it is applied seriously you know if there is the rule of law and there is an open discussion going on these are the saving graces of of human beings finding uh, uh, outlets for critiquing what what is going on and rectifying it but it it comes down to that aspect of that rule of law being present or that constitution that um is being upheld to its uh, to its right ways is 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 present because many of these places that's why that's why churchill said and, and i'm not a big fan of churchill myself but that's no. what he said right that uh, uh, all forms of government are bad but democracy is just the worst the, the best of the worst in some sense so it, however much we may have our uh, critiques of democracy it still presents that uh, equality of all individuals and that rule of law presents itself over uh let's say the rule of force or something of that sort i i tend to agree with you yeah but we have examples of restricted sort of democracy like singapore mm. and and you know some of these societies in southeast asia when i was there i was very impressed by the singaporean model it wasn't there wasn't a free press there was only one newspaper mm. where the government uh uh position was every day you know published and 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 so on so not democracy as you have in india the argumentative indian for example many newspapers talk shows nothing of the sort but people were guaranteed their security and and it was a very, it is a very peaceful society very little crime takes place yeah. so it depends on what sort of society is there and what sort of cultural uh, legacies are yeah. present in a certain situation but dr raman don't you think that it also comes down to what society what kind of a society you want to live in because don't you think and you're a political scientist so you'd know this much better than i do that th- this was in some sense the the difference between aristotle and plato right where plato said that no it's more important how long a civilization lives but aristotle is no it's it's not important how long it lives but how it lives so you could have a society that lives for eons but if you don't have that aspect of freedom within a society then is it really a society to live in like for example many of the people uh, like the chinese communist uh, the chinese communist party in some sense for the p- people from the outside yes we can critique it for its uh, let's say there's no democracy and and the treatment of uh, uh, the yuka population which is in my essence reprehensible but when you also look at aspects of how they've lifted people out of uh, poverty and 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 those sorts of things it is really difficult to sort of balance it and and i think that is what political science is to find that balance of um, how you walk that path quite right that's why i gave the example of singapore yeah. which was only a fishing village in 1965 and now it's a very prosperous part of the world and china is another example that you give it's a del- it's it's not easy to 
pass judgment on it because they have yeah. lifted millions out of poverty for sure and yeah. yet, yet it's not a free society any uh, uh, opposition is repressed uh, you know people are sent to prison and kept there and then this vigor muslims mm. their situation it's reprehensible as you say and i totally agree so yeah. one can take a utilitarian position sometimes if the majority is benefiting then it is good and one can hope that at some point within china people will want democracy and there will be a transformation yeah this is what people also hope will happen in russia ultimately maybe this war that putin has started may get uh, out of control for him hmm. and and expedite his exit i mean i was looking at some of the things people were saying and i'm sharing them with you although also I, so yeah yeah although i think uh this war in in ukraine could have been avoided had the ukrainian government given assurances that they are not going to join nato yeah why do they need to join nato yaar explain to <laughs> me why you can join the european union so mm. benefit as much as you can from the economic possibilities sweden and finland are also members of the european union but they are mm. neutral states so this was a provocation but should uh uh putin have gone in all out with his army and invaded ukraine we can never justify that but we have to still understand why he did yeah so that's what we are doing now you and, and i Yeah. <laughs> isn't isn't that what is most fascinating because i saw that video of yours uh, on the ukraine uh, crisis that has happened recently but uh, i've also heard many other people who talk about this aspect that um, while we identify ukraine as a sovereign country we then put these limitations on them much than but why do they have to join nato or something of that sort so in some time in some sense you have freedom but there are always limitations on your freedom because um it, people would not like to admit this but uh, it is the the american global empire that we are living in in some sense but And... isn't look at what the americans themselves have done yeah you know the cuban uh, missile crisis hmm. cuba was placing uh, nuclear missiles on its soil which would have threatened us security and so the americans wanted to go to all out war over it yeah yeah but they had missiles placed in turkey and in all these places directed against the soviet union hmm. how do you apply two principles then elande of chile was an elected marxist president he, he wasn't a dictator the cia engineered a coup against him and had him overthrown and it was a violent overthrow he was killed many other chileans were killed so what have the americans not done exactly to enhance their own security yeah. they came all the way to iraq libya afghanistan yeah. okay he was a dictator but what have they left behind a bleeding iraq out of which came isis and and then you have their main enemy iran actually being the main uh, beneficiary of the destruction of saddam hussein and now blair they have given you know he has been knighted i have to mm. i have been told is it not true i, I haven't seen but tony you there you're talking and maybe this is not true because somebody was telling <laughs> me this and i haven't read it myself they yeah, say I'm that i'm not tony okay. blair okay i'm not sure but don't you think this is in some sense more dangerous than let's say hard power this aspect of soft power that uh, america and many other places in the west are sort of implementing that they go like wh- why does the us care uh, if afghanistan has to look like new jersey like why do they have to go to afghanistan and tell them that no 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 you have to implement democracy otherwise you're not a perfect state or something of that sort don't you think that in itself is however we may not see it that way it is in some sense spreading that american ethos around the world and uh, the modern it, world yeah yeah but exactly but then can't one also argue that putin doesn't like hmm. uh, ukraine becoming 
a satellite of the of the west through nato yeah what's the difference if they want to impose democracy on afghanistan all the way from the united states because that's yeah. what they think is right putin is doing the same yeah only in the west putin is the uh, is the villain but not what the americans do they promote peace democracy freedom all that and yeah. yet the americans have supported the worst dictatorships in latin america mm. and and saudi arabia and all you know were their best allies so they have had no problems in having good relations with dictators themselves for so sure this is not even handed even handed policy american uh, uh they think that the world should be recast in a, in 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 the light of their ideal yeah idea of freedom and individualism and so on and it's not easy also in some sense i would like to connect this to how people sort of view like the hindu right sort of sees the idea of india that nehru sort of nehru sardar patel gandhi all these people sort of conceived of because even they say that only only in skin you're indian but in like intellect uh, thoughts tastes everything you're english and and in some sense you can make that argument because uh, the argument is that Uh, where are like the sanskrit traditions where are like the language we speak everything else the way uh, people conceive of the nation is in some sense you may not see it that way but it is under it it is built on a christian ethos uh, or, or or something of that so that that is trying to be spread through the united states through england do you do you see any sort of um, validity in their argument um the people's uh, like i don't know there's this recent uh, historian who who has got like a lot of criticism because of plagiarism in india i'm not sure if you've heard of him vikram sampath uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I that wrote, was his a comment saying that the worst sin we commit as academics is plagiarism yeah so if he is a plagiarist for me he is no historian he's he's a dishonest man when it comes to dealing with uh, contentious issues in history Yeah, he's a hagiographer. If this is correct, then this yeah. is unforgivable. Yeah. 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 No, but in some sense, what do you make of that idea? Do you think there is validity in this in this argument that uh, the modern Indians are only Indians by skin in in terms of intellect, tastes, everything else? They're pretty much Western, and 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 they want like a Western conception to be uh, put forward. But can't one turn the argument to the idea of a authentic indian idea of whatever is right and wrong would then not caste system be the basis of the society yeah. that you should really establish should not the dalit be driven back into you know uh, uh, he is he is actually not part of the varna system at all yeah so where in that uh, vedic india i mean or let's say post vedic before the before islam and christianity did the oppressed people really have any good standing in society no, no. so western i look at these things in terms of what is universal is for everyone and it doesn't matter where it originates hmm. don't the indians claim that they they invented the zero yeah. they given the whole world the zero isn't it yeah so if the zero from india can really revolutionize mathematics it proves it is a universal dis- dis- discovery and it's no longer it originated in india but it uh, transformed the whole uh, discipline of mathematics or arithmetic whatever you want to call it so things which are universal it doesn't matter where they originate if i think human rights are for every individual having the right to dignity the right to protection of the law not to be uh, uh, dealt with arbitrarily but under the laws of the state all these ideas are good for individuals as they are yeah that they originated in the west doesn't really matter yeah 
after all the the tanks and the cars and the uh, soft software they are using none of this has an uh, uh, an indian origin they are all inventions in the west which with which people all over the world are trying to uh, make use of what about ishtiyak sir we don't know them but right talking, yeah you know, right now, did it come from the islamic civilization or <laughs> or the indic civilization not at all so these are but, silly ideas they yeah, are silly ideas but ishtiyak sir like uh, they would take it so far that i've heard some of them even say that um, like the coding that's happening nowadays should be done in sanskrit because apparently that is more um, I don't know that that is more easy for computers to read or something of that sort. So many of these people, and and I think uh, you've touched about this in a couple of your videos that the conception of the Hindu right that that what Hindu nationalism is built on, um, uh, and this aspect of Akhand Bharat is is of this aspect that um, but they're even trying to critique the Aryan invasion theory that it was not really the Aryans who came into India uh, or and lived through sev uh, through through generations, but it's more that. this is being propagated now the out of india theory so it was the yeah, indians yeah. who went out and sort of uh, civilized the world or something of that sort yeah, yeah. um and yeah and 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 that is in some sense what is um, i would say that obviously those sorts of arguments should be there but it should be done through peer re a peer review process where people can actually go and critique the work so you can have your aryan invasion theory and you can have the out of india theory but i let, have another i have another question which i would like to pose through you to yeah. my uh hindu hindu right <laughs> right friends they talk about what is happening in pakistan is the karma and so on okay <laughs> i hear it every uh, daily you know yeah they must explain to me what was done wrong by the hindu civilization that for more the more than a thousand years foreigners came and and mm. ruled india and they were enslaved according to their own uh uh you know litany hmm. how do they explain that there must be something seriously flawed in in the in the general civilization that foreigners came defeated them and started ruling but so what is that karma story how do you explain yeah. karma you know ultimately deciding your fate so Doctor Ahmed, it's it's uh it's this aspect that is again very dangerous uh that is happening again, right? It's this aspect of victimhood that's come about, and this was the same uh, th this aspect of victimhood, the Hindu victimhood, victimhood. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is such a dangerous concept in my opinion because if you look through history, uh, with the with the civilizations that played on this uh, role a lot more, like. let's say if you look at the oppressors and the oppressed in soviet union or if you look at uh, let's say uh, the nazis uh, in in nazi germany or any anywhere of that sort where 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 this aspect of victimhood was really played out that it was only the jews and the jews are stealing everything they're marrying right. your women they're getting the jobs and that's what translated to this aspect of hatred and so the hindu right would say that it was because uh, the hindus didn't have a shared there was a general conception of the land they lived in but everyone was first let's say a marathi or first a uh, bengali or first a uh, south indian and and then maybe second a hindu or something of that sort and and they say that because there wasn't unity in in their diversity that these people could come and and, and rule over us that's okay, why good. that's so why saurkar yeah so they are admitting it then na huh? yeah there was there was something seriously missing in the indian situation hmm right i i would grant that i wouldn't have a problem in accepting that so i'm saying rectify that never let india be enslaved or invaded by another power be strong assert yeah. your freedom but doing it in a way uh, as victims is is uh, to be self critical is good but to resort to this victimhood sort of thing is is uh, uh, has a negative connotation i think yeah yeah you can rectify what is wrong in your own civilization and become better that i can understand uh, i totally so, agree i totally agree yeah, yeah. Th that's the way i look at it i mean there is of course the west came and brutalized many societies uh 
Latin America society has almost disappeared. India didn't. India lasted with its four, five thousand years. Some people say twenty five thousand years old no. <laughs> temples and all. I don't know how they do this counting. Yeah, <laughs> history historical record is two thousand, two thousand five hundred years recorded uh, history. Yeah, before there is archaeology, hmm. and now we have DNA. These hmm. are the levels. But I keep hearing no twenty five thousand years ago. You know this great invention was done by Hindus and so on. What can you do with this? I mean, they say this is historically true. Yeah, but where are the Hindus? Hindus right now, like they're all running away to America. So, like, if the land was so great, then they would have stayed, right? So, <laughs> so this is all like a lot of vanity is involved now that we are a great civilization, and uh, we have to blame others. Hmm. for all the harm they did us i'm sure a lot of harm was done by the invaders and so on but there must be something wrong within you that this could happen yeah and i think the caste system was one let me tell you i when i was doing this research on the partition a friend of mine uh, yuvraj krishan from lahore and then i met him in uh, vasant kunj again you know I mean, I didn't know him from Lahore. I met him in India. He mm -hmm. was senior. Yeah, he said that up until the thirties in the Punjab, the Brahmin, the Khatri, and the Vaishya could not sit together and eat, uh, you know, from the same. Yeah, they were served uh, uh, food separately. So if you have so many, you know, divisions within your own upper caste. what about the obcs and then the people at the bottom how do you explain that as a strength of your uh, civilization no it's the other way around yeah. others came and dominated you because you were divided within yourself so there is nothing so grand about the uh, indic civilization yeah of course it achieved many grand things and gave the world the zero of course but then remained zero itself <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah that's yeah. a horrible thing to say but this is true yeah, yeah. and that is in some sense why a uh, savarkar's conception of hindutva is so different to hinduism and that's why many people in india also also shy away from let's say hindutva because if you sort of track it to its roots that savarkar and gorwarkar uh, who actually conceptualized this idea on a on a large front they actually took it from nazism they said that um what what the nazis did in some sense yes people will critique them but in terms of the extermination of the other uh, of the other let's say civilization they were totally able to do that and i think this was what hitler said as well when uh, he had gone ahead with the with the argument that people will critique us but who today remembers the armenians so he was referring to the armenian genocide that happened back in the day and that was horrific and brutal as well but do you think that this is true that it is only a certain number of time where people forget so however brutal a thing may be if there is let's say a span of years that 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 goes ahead people will inevitably forget about the instances that happened in the past your um genghis khans of the world your armenian genocide and would we say the same thing about the nazi regime as well maybe 100 200 years down in the future who knows because 200 years from now uh people would would be detached from these conditions yeah and probably would take a a different position than we who are living in these times one thing probably which would make a difference is that because of the internet facebook and all these facilities what is happening today is documented much better than what was possible in the past so like this war in uh, ukraine we can see daily the events which are taking place so it's very difficult to hide your crimes now but maybe 200 years from now even this becomes a source of entertainment that well a war took place 
and and this thing happened and and so on but uh that doesn't mean that that's the right way to go forward oh for sure yeah yeah, yeah. because what happened to hitler and the japanese state we also must take into account yeah they paid a very heavy price for that um i was um, really interested to also talk to you about your book uh, the pakistan garrison state origins evolution consequences from 1947 to 2011 um and i think you have touched about in this interview as well um uh, when jina the conception the different conceptions he had and i think i've heard you in a different interview saying that where he did win the case for pakistan as a state there was virtually no vision as to how the state should function and you mentioned right. that uh, the people who are let's say uh, from a secular bent often quote his speech that um, pakistan should be a secular state uh, but people from an islamist viewpoint say that but why then demand a pakistan or something of that sort so what was your general uh, inkling of writing this book and what do you think this book uh, was able to achieve well the garrison state book i think you are confusing the two or connecting the two jena and and garrison state book okay, in the yeah, garrison uh, yeah. in the garrison state book i tried to explain why two states which came into being on the same day one went on to become an elected democracy and the other failed hmm. so why the supremacy of civilians was not established in pakistan that was the main concern and so in that book i show that the type of pakistan which emerged out of the partition was indefensible in case india were to attack pakistan and i think the british must have planned it this way that let pakistan well if they want pakistan this is the pakistan we give them because the pakistani leadership already before pakistan came into being jinnah sent isfahani his right hand man to to the united states to plead with the americans not to oppose the creation of pakistan saying that we will serve as your front line state not only in south asia but also in the middle east because we have cultural ties with the yeah. middle east and the muslim league was no political party comparable to the indian national congress it was a collection of forces local regional who did not want the end of zimmedari system hmm. who wanted to protect their privileges in 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 pakistan once pakistan came into being the muslim league lacked a vision of how to go about making pakistan democratic and federal so two principles have collided in pakistan how to make pakistan a federal state it has for most you know it has mostly functioned like a quasi uh, a unitary state you know mm. with the center being overbearing huh? or it has been either some sort of a liberal muslim type of state or an islamic state with fundam with uh uh dogmatic laws also uh included in the in the legal system and in the constitution so uh that's what i mean that pakistan pakistan became a garrison state because the only institution which could give it stability and continuity was the pakistan military hmm so it has stepped in because the failure the politicians failed over and over again you know we got the first constitution only in 1956 but there were no elections until 1970 the first national election free election you know free and fair was in 1970 and it culminated with the breakup of pakistan so which has been the stabilizing factor the fact that we have had an effective military as an institution for good and bad 
Yeah, I think there is one quote of yours where you say that um, most nations have an army, but in the case of Pakistan, the army has a nation. <laughs> That's correct. The second thing about uh, the Jinnah book, well, I have shown that the 11th August speech is just one speech of its kind. Nothing precedes it and nothing follows after it. This speech is on the 11th of August, but on the 14th of August, when the Pakistan Constituent Assembly was actually inaugurated, Mountbatten, who had come to represent the British monarch, got up and said, now you have your own state mm. and you have, uh, you know, the model of Akbar as a great uh, mm. ruler. And ho hopefully Pakistan would be uh, uh, taking inspiration from such rulers. And Jinnah gets up and says, well, Akbar is all right, but our main source of inspiration is Prophet Muhammad, who first defeated the Jews and Christians and then treated them ideally. So he brought in the Islamic factor immediately three days after he made this uh, allegedly secular speech. Hmm. And then I have given many instances. He wrote to the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna, to send a scholar to come to Pakistan and tell them how to make Pakistan an ideal Muslim state. You know the Muslim Brotherhood? Hmm. Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood? Then the only department he established was the Institute of Islamic Reconstruction in Lahore, where whose uh, uh, whose task was to advise Pakistan government how to become a, a true Islamic state, have an Islamic economy, an Islamic educational system. Then on the 20, 25th of January 1948, where he addressed people, uh, you know, members of the Karachi Bar Association, he said, he was irritated and said, why do people keep asking me what will be the constitution of Pakistan? The constitution of Pakistan was given 1300 years ago, which means from the origins of Islam, and it will be a democracy which will take care of its uh, minorities and so on. And then finally, in, in July or June 1948, soon after... Thereafter, he died, you know. Yeah. Uh, while inaugurating the Pakistan State Bank, he said, we don't want any isms. We want you to give us guidelines how to build a, an Islamic economy. So all those speeches and all those statements are also part of his legacy. And just one speech where no Islam is mentioned, but no secular, the word secular is also missing there. Mm. He could have given the example of Turkey as what he thought was uh, a state to emulate. But he says, no, we should learn from the British. But the British took several centuries to become a sort of liberal uh, 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 democracy. Democratic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so there's, that's the way I, I look at the Pakistan situation. Yeah. In singling out uh, Jinnah in particular, do you think he was uh, one of those individuals who would, who was very Machiavellian in his own way? So if if there was an individual who was, let's say, more secular bent, and he came to him saying that, Acha, how should the conception of Pakistan be and on what grounds? Then he would give him a certain answer. But if someone else came to him who was, let's say, more Islamic, then he would give them another answer. Do you think that was a lot that played into Jinnah's idea when he was sort of arguing for uh, a Pakistan? Of course, I dis I demonstrated over uh, several pages how he made contradictory promises to different sections of the Muslims. Yeah, Indeed, this is absolutely the case which in Pakistan nobody wants to admit. <laughs> to the ulama, he said, of course, in yeah. a state founded for Muslims, it's unthinkable that we would have a state which would be contrary to Islamic values and principles and so on. 
and in the election campaign in 1945-46, the ulema went around propagating an ideal Islamic state. And then he's on record giving a promise to the Pir Saab of Manki Sharif, a powerful uh, spiritual leader of the Northwest Frontier Province, that uh, indeed in a constituent assembly where 75% of the members would be Muslims, all laws and the constitution would reflect Islamic values and principles. But to the British, he kept on saying that uh, democracy is in our blood, Islam is democratic, and, 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 you know, things like this. But he never, ever used the word secular for Pakistan. Not even once. So Not even in the this, this fabled 11th August 1947 speech, which everybody invokes, you know. Yeah. The word secular is missing. Dr. Ahmed, do you think that um, later on, when Pakistan did come into being, you also talk a little bit about this aspect that um, which Islam is the right Islam? Because there were different interpretations that started to play out of Islam as well. And later down the line, I think uh, you've also mentioned that uh, when Ali Bhutto came into power, there were different approaches to, let's say, land from, uh, land owning that were, that were implemented. Whereas... Uh, where you talk about that there were different interpretations of the Islam and people who were of the socialist bent were saying that no, Islam preaches socialism. Or yeah. maybe some people who were of the capitalistic uh, aspect of things said that no, uh, Islam has no boundaries as to how much land you can own. So can you also maybe uh, give us a little brief about um, when Pakistan did come into being, the conflicting clashes that were there within, let's say, uh, the Islamic faith of people who wanted to build a nation, but uh, had different conceptions of how the nation should be built on Islamic lines. Absolutely. I mean, there is this uh, Munir report written after the anti Ahmadiyya riots in Punjab in 1953, where the two judges who were presiding, Justice Munir and Justice Kiani, they write, no two ulema could agree before us in defining a Muslim. Each one of them had a different conception of who is a Muslim. And this is people who belong to the same school of thought within Islam. Apart from that, the fact is that the Muslims were as divided as Hindus, let's say. Hindus, if we can say on caste, the mm -hmm. Muslims on sect. The Sunni-Shia conflict originated at the very advent of Islam and continues to this day, then within the Sunni majority, there are different sects. The more, uh, you know, Sufi oriented, but now the most militant uh, uh, Barelvis. Then you have the Diobandis, you know, the left wing of the Dioband, the majority, they supported the Indian National Congress, but some of them broke away and joined the Muslim League. Then you have the Ahle Hadiths who are Wahhabis, you know, Saudi oriented, and none of them accept each other as full Muslims. You know, they they think they 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 their belief is flawed, and they have declared one group completely out of Islam, the Ahmadiyya. And so this happened when there was no Hindu and Sikh to point a finger at. It was within Islam. The second problem was that Pakistan had different linguistic nationalities, Bengalis, Punjabis, Pakhtuns, Sindhis, Baloch. Mm. And the federal issue has not been resolved. Well, there is an 18th Amendment now, but it's not been implemented yet fully. So they also uh, uh, fell out in terms of what sort of a federation Pakistan would be. As long as East Pakistan was part of Pakistan, they tried to negate the majority of the Bengalis by on the basis of the principle of parity, equal mm -hmm. representation for both parts of Pakistan. Although the Bengalis were 55%. 
then when this was removed in 1970 and the bengalis got 55% representation they the awami league alone could get enough seats in 300 seats they got 160 161 i think and were entitled to form the government and that was not acceptable to west pakistani power holders you know and so there was the civil war and pakistan broke up so within the muslim community all those contradictions of sect subsect ethnicity or let's say language uh, uh, continue to be endemic and continue to dictate politics so jena jena's genius was to somehow hide all this and present i give this example that the congress's dilemma was that it was a secular party hmm. and it had some leading muslims in its leadership ranks you know so it could not launch a campaign against islam they just could not yeah the muslim league was an entirely muslim party for them to attack hinduism was natural if they were to get pakistan yeah so in a way the congress was handicapped they didn't take up the contradictions within islam as as to counter you know uh, uh the claim of jina that the muslims were a homogenous uh, uh community one nation they just didn't do that so that's been another problem but jina somehow succeeded in mobilizing all these people giving them different promises and all those promises have come to haunt pakistan once he was gone as long as he was there nobody dared question him yeah <laughs> he made some decisions which were entirely undemocratic dismissing elected governments and i think yeah. you've also mentioned you've also mentioned uh, in recent talks that in some sense people still don't question jina because in the in the history writing that's done and you um like i think you've mentioned that uh, you've had some beef with uh, alisha jalal who almost who's almost painted a picture of jina uh, without using any of his speeches or any of the things he's actually said but almost writing writing a fiction as to what of of what jina actually wanted in the conception of pakistan so why try the book is here if you want i can show it you feel you, free feel free <laughs> no no the soul spokesman this is the title of the book yeah yeah then the subtitle is jina the muslim league and the demand of pakistan so the soul spokesman is both jina and the muslim league for the muslims of india fine how can when you say the spokesman what did jina speak not a single speech from 1906 to the day he died is given in the book and she claims that from 1939 onwards jina was you know campaigning for a power sharing deal within a united india between muslims and hindus as two equal nations and that it was the congress which forced partition on jina i have then i was never convinced about this but you know scholars tend to uh, in good faith sort of accept and uh, her research was very popular with the left in pakistan okay so when i started looking at the speeches the story is entirely diametrically opposite i have said from 22nd march 1940 now remember that hmm. that's one day before the lahore resolution is uh, moved go through the speeches of jena all his speeches just bring one speech one statement one message interview anywhere where he has said we want a power sharing deal with uh, the indian national congress no 
nothing of the sort. The only time where he says we want India partition, I, I mentioned that the Lahore session of the Muslim League was from 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th of March 1940. The same day when the Lahore session ended, Jinnah gives a press conference. And in the press conference, he says that we have made a historic demand, which is for the division of India. Aisha Jalal doesn't even mention yeah. that press conference, which is part of the of the ongoing session of the uh, Lahore session. And then from that day onwards, Jinnah, with unbelievable constancy, you know, uh, unflinching emphasis says we want partition. He tells the Muslims and the Hindu Muslim majority uh, uh, provinces, you are bound to be a minority, so don't stand in the way of the majority Muslims of North East and North West. And this he says in Delhi, the same he says in uh, Bombay, and then all the way in Madras. And in Ahmedabad, don't stand in our way. We want Northeast and Northwest to become independent. And then when he was challenged in Kanpur, that what will happen to us, he says, mm -hmm. this is 30th of March, 1941. He says, I'll have two crore Muslims. Two crore is 20 million. Actually, he should have said 30 crores, uh, 30 million, three crore because that's what was left in India. I would have two crore Muslims experience martyrdom, shahadat, and get smashed in order to liberate seven crore Muslims. Actually, it should have been six crore Muslims to be the correct figure. So here is someone saying, I want the Muslim minority in the Hindu majority provinces to be smashed. So mm -hmm. if the BJP and RSS are allegedly now doing that. Jinnah was prepared for all this to get Pakistan. Jinnah wanted Pakistan and he used all those arguments which would justify the division of India. Simple as that. Wow. Um, Dr. Ahmed, like the little I know of uh, Jinnah's early life, when he when he was uh, in the UK as a student, many people and I think many secular people also in Pakistan have talked about this aspect that uh, he was really influenced by John Locke uh, and Thomas Hobbes and their uh, conception of, let's say, as a classical liberal. And I think in the UK, he also called himself a classical liberal. Why didn't that aspect sort of play out when he when when there was a conception of Pakistan? So. He could have, couldn't he have built, let's say, a Pakistan on classical liberal lines or or on secular democratic lines? Or do you think he he was always unable because he wanted to please both sides? If uh, the Islamics, uh, the Islamic individuals don't move away from him and he loses major votes, my general question is that why didn't he uh, sort of implement well, it? If he the classical liberal. Uh was fully expressed during his first phase as the Indian nationalist. Okay. Yeah. There he's a full-blooded liberal. He dismisses all suggestions that uh, religion matters. He says, we are all Indians hmm. and we want self-government and self-rule and all that. And he's very critical of British policies. It's only when Gandhi comes in and assumes the leadership. The, under Gandhi, Congress becomes a mass party. Yeah. And Jinnah was uncomfortable with mass politics, you know, civil disobedience and non-cooperation. He didn't like those, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mass politics of, of Gandhi. Yeah. And so he left Congress. And then when he assumed the leadership of the of the of the muslim separatist movement thereafter his liberalism and his uh, individual whatever is is 
subordinated. I mean, it, it all disappears to the dichotomy he drew between Hindus and Muslims as two hostile nations. So the, the total weight of the ideas he then injected into his campaign is overwhelmingly Islamic and communal. Having done that and getting Pakistan, I have, this is what I have argued. People have had great difficulty in understanding this. That a leader or the creator of an idea uh, doesn't control the idea he has produced once it becomes part of mass consciousness. Hmm. So once he had created this wall between Hindus and Muslims and demanded the partition of India, and that partition had cost 1 million lives, 14 million people driven out of their homes, you know, with women raped and abducted and children killed, you know, in, a, in horrible ways. Then to say that Pakistan is going to be another secular, it's, it's going to be India B, secular democratic state, made no sense. Yeah. The 11th August speech then connects maybe to his early commitment as a, as a liberal. But was he serious about it? We don't know because on the 14th, when uh, Mountbatten mentioned Akbar, he got up and contradicted him and said, Prophet Muhammad is our example. So that's not a liberal example to give. Yeah. yeah. And then I've given you all the other instances where he uh, writes to the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood hmm. to send some scholar to tell Pakistanis what to do in order to become a true Muslim state. That's one. Then I've given you the other things as well. Dr. Ahmed, like, uh, I wanted to ask you about like the relationship that um, Gandhi had with Jinnah because I read in... Um, Ramchandra Guha's book on Gandhi, uh, I think Gandhi, the years that changed the world. Um, I think several times in the interactions between Gandhi and Jinnah, Gandhi had done so much to sort of keep, uh, let's say, uh, the Muslim and to not have a partition that he'd also mentioned that um, when we have independence, I will allow, I will give you the uh, prime, the prime ministership uh, of United India. So when the, is, first of all, is there any truth in that statement? Or, and second of all, like if there were those sorts of um, inclusions that, let's say, the Congress party was willing to make, uh, because I think even sometimes that you've mentioned that um, when the Muslim League hadn't garnered as much votes, um, and many of the Muslims had actually voted for the INA, the Indian National Congress, the INC, rather, that um, and, and Nehru and people in the Congress party had said that if you want to be part of the national struggle, you can quit the Muslim League and join the National Congress to sort of have a have a bigger say on the constitution and those sorts of things. So is there any s truth in any of those statements? And uh, if so, like why didn't he sort of choose the path uh, of the Congress? Well, first of all, I think there are several instances where Gandhi tried to convince Jinnah to work for a united India for a democratic, inclusive India, like the 16th January letter saying that you are the only leader of such stature who can create an alternative party to the Indian National Congress yeah. and become the de democratic alternative to the Congress. Jinnah rejected it. Then I've gone through the correspondence between uh, Gandhi and Jena Nehru and Jena uh, Subhash Chandra Bose and Jena Rajender Prashad and Jena what we notice there is that after 1937 Jena rejected all proposals of the Indian National Congress to reach a compromise he wanted the congress to declare itself a Hindu party and accept Muslim League as the only party of the Muslims. I think the first thing was impossible. How could the Congress, in order to negotiate 
first declare itself to be a hindu party second how could it abandon those muslims who had stood by the congress all along like the khudai khidmat guards of the northwest frontier province abdul ghafar mm-hmm. khan and all they remained loyal to the congress till the very end and they were opposed to the muslim league then what about the jumiyat ulama hind the biggest organization of northern indian muslims the ulama who sided with the indian national congress then you have abul kalam azad and so many other great or well known muslims sayed mahmood of bihar and uh, asif ali and and i'm just mentioning a few names yeah how could such a party in in order to reach a deal with jina except that it's a hindu party and at the same time reject all other parties and accept the indian uh, muslim league as the only party of the muslims no i think jina had decided not to have any truck with the congress at any point but coming now to this proposal from gandhi that uh, we can make jina the prime minister and he can even he can uh, choose his own ministers or even have mun- uh, uh, ministers only from the muslim league and the congress would support it this was conveyed by gandhi to the cabinet mission mm. and nobody has mentioned it but viceroy wevel said i can't make jena the prime minister all real authority will be exercised by the vice viceroy yeah and so it was never conveyed to jena but even if they had done jena wouldn't be tempted by it really <laughs> no it's impossible i mean it would show that the only thing he struggled was to become the prime minister of india yeah and lose his own you know respect and honor for whatever he did i don't think that would have uh, uh, been successful but this was never really conveyed to jena okay we uh, will killed it and not as in the gandhi film that <laughs> had killed uh, i didn't find that evidence yeah. i found evidence of wevel doing it why okay. did it i don't know hmm. yeah that would have been an interesting thing to see in full um don't you think that even with the antagonism let's say that uh, jena had with the national congress and in uh, gandhi in particular that um, do you think there was a deep admiration he had within himself of gandhi as like a mass leader of the of the national struggle and something that maybe he would have wanted to emulate but uh, that that wasn't the case because i this this instance comes to mind and i don't know how true it is that um, when gandhi ji was assassinated um, and jinnah got the news in his residence in pakistan he told his uh, secretary that uh, i will not be taking any meetings for the rest of the day um and i would just want to be left alone because he said that if gandhi's died then much of me has died as well and and this is to say that many of the many of the rivals that we have in terms of intellectual rivals in terms of people who we disagree with um if in their demise much of us lo- is lost as well because in some sense they've they've been uh, they've been the wall that so- sort of made us who we are and it made made a stronghold our arguments in in what sense do you do you think that there was a deep admiration that uh, jena had of gandhi or do you think it's all just um, no yeah. i i've never heard this story and i don't think it has any basis any grounding fact. oh okay no. what what we know is and it's given in the book on jena is that when the news that gandhi was assassinated was conveyed to jena uh, he immediately issued a statement that the great leader of the hindu community oh yeah, yeah. so so and apparently his secretary who was an englishman said can't we just say the great leader of gandhi he said no mention hindu okay so the first statement is gandhi the great leader of the uh, the leader of the great hindu community something like this yeah yeah that he had principles and when he had principles he stood for them that's there okay but afterwards in the pakistan constituent assembly the chief ministers of punjab 
ممتاز دولتانہ دا چیف منسٹر آف بنگال خواجہ ناظم الدین دا چیف منسٹر آف سندھ ایوب کھوڑو اینڈ دا پرائم منسٹر آف پاکستان لیاقت علی خان میڈ پیڈ ویری جینرس ٹریبیوٹ ہومیج ٹو گاندھی سینگ دیٹ دس واز از گریٹسٹ آر دیٹ ناؤ وین ہی واز نیڈیڈ ٹو پریونٹ اٹیکس آن مسلمس ہی ہیڈ گیون اپ از لائف ڈوئنگ دیٹ سو دا ان دا فائنل اسپیچ ہی دین سیز دیٹ گاندھی واز اے گریٹ لیڈر دا ہندو ورڈ ایکسکلوڈیڈ ان دا فائنل بٹ ڈورنگ دا کیمپین فار پاکستان ہی کیپٹ آن ڈسکرائبنگ گاندھی ایز اے فیشسٹ Yes, yes, this, these are the words he uses. He, he was fixated by the fact that, or the feeling that Gandhi stole the leadership of the Indian uh, people from him, that he was the natural born leader. Who, and if that had remained true, then it was all right. But he could not be second, second yeah. fiddle to Gandhi. That was also a problem of his ego, I think. Hmm. So I don't think there is anything like uh, 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 him saying that a part of me is dead and all. Yeah, Where you I know, know so much, so, so much of so much of this, as you said, like that that becomes really difficult for me, and that's why I wanted to run it through you because so much almost goes uh, in in the modern landscape of history reading that we do. Uh, that it it becomes really difficult to sort of differentiate what was fact and what was uh, and what is just like fiction because but i had do you have my jena book do you have my jena book i have ordered it but in the uk there are very few copies i <laughs> i know this is okay. horrible they are, yeah it's they are making it difficult for the book to get to the uk I have you that. have you have you sort of spoken to any of the publishers because even for the punjab i have book, pleaded the damn, with them i have pleaded with them but yeah Nobody because because heat. even even for the Punjab book on I think I only found like a few copies on Amazon and other places it's very difficult to sort of find it so yeah I mean Dr Emma uh, this has been a fascinating conversation I've thoroughly enjoyed it uh, just one particular question before we leave can okay. you give us some book recommendations um, it could be anything it could be on the subcontinent it could be uh, on political science it could be books that have influenced you in the way you look at the world So yeah of course people should read all your books as well <laughs> but uh, any other books I uh... want to say read my book <laughs> to begin with uh well I have read Nehru's books I think they are worth reading uh, Gandhi ji I have read then uh right now Nelson Mandela's uh, you know autobiography is worth reading if you want to look at the role of great people huh? mm. but uh, bertrand russell uh, history of western philosophy fascinates me that's one book i've always recommended people to read then uh, did you know did you know uh, bertrand russell has a cameo in a bollywood film Fun probably fact. i see i didn't know that uh-huh. <laughs> there was this film back in the day called amar and he has a uh, bertrand russell has a cameo in that so <laughs> okay I'll, i'll check it huh <laughs> and then uh, bhagat singh's why i am an atheist atheist yeah that's worth reading a uh, uh, man of only 23 24 writing such a ma- mature uh, uh, thesis you know mm. on his reasons for being an atheist is fascinating uh, right now i'm too tired to think of yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have talked I'm, for more than two hours i think yeah and i've thoroughly enjoyed it i'm sorry if i kept you uh, really long so uh, i enjoyed I'd... it too because doing this in english is quite rare but okay. when you send me the uh, yeah video then we'll share it so people sure. who just who don't understand hindi or urdu can also benefit yeah yeah that's what i was wondering because many of your interviews and talks have been in like uh, english i would say <laughs> english is like a word is used in india ki matlab yeah. thoda bahut hindi thoda bahut english Asal but yeah me, all my education has been in english yeah but if i were to do videos only in english very few people will follow me for sure yeah so no, as an academic i am not used to speaking either urdu or any language when it is you know academic stuff ha huh. but doing it i must 
and so a lot of english comes in that's the reason no uh, listen uh, dr ahmed like i'd love to have this conversation sometime again in the future uh, sure. thank you once again for coming on and yeah i'll uh, end the recording Thank all you all way. for tuning in. Thank you was so much. Was it live? Were people watching? Yeah. It? Yes. 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 Are there some people who are watching? Can you check how many were there? Um. Currently, it shows about like five, uh, fifty people that were watching it. So uh -huh. maybe people will tune in. But obviously, this is just the number of people who are watching it right now. Uh, when it gets uploaded, also people will watch it later on and those sorts That's of things. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, for right, coming right, in, yeah. everybody. Uh, so it's great.